Greetings, welcome. Welcome to the Red Hen Press Poetry Hour, brought to you by The Broad at Home. I'm your host, Sandra Singlo, and standing in for the beautiful Broad stage in Santa Monica is my slightly dark looking living room in Pasadena, um, but it's very comfortable and we're very happy to have you. Uh, and we're streaming now via Facebook Live, and I remind you we are live because we are very interested in seeing your comments as we go along in this evening. It's our one hour together, sort of in our pajamas at the end of the week. Um, I'm Tonight I'm having herbal tea. Afterwards will be the very dry kava. Whatever, let us know what you're having at home. You know, two buck chuck tea, making banana bread, whatever. More importantly, let us know what you think of our poets and our poems as they come forward. And we'd like to kind of weave that into a live conversation as, as we can if we see that. So um, welcome and we're we're so happy to have you. To kick things off, I'd like to introduce the producers of our show. First, we have co-founder and managing editor of Red Hen Press, Kate Gale. Hi, glad to be hey, here. You're looking good in your dress, which we'll be seeing soon and we'll soon learn why. And I'd like to also warmly welcome artistic and executive director of the Broad Stage, Rob Bayless. Hi everyone. Oh, look at that scarf, looking good. Yes, indeed. I wasn't gonna be left out of this one. Uh, <laughs> we'll see in a moment why. And um, so here we are, fourth week thoughts from you two as we open into our very exciting evening and our very exciting featured poet. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm very excited to be here with this group of poets, uh, all of whom are amazing, amazing poets. I was earlier on the Japan American Museum's uh, virtual fundraiser, and uh, Bryn um, has written so eloquently about her grandparents being at Manzanar. And so, of course, I thought about her uh, when I was at their virtual fundraiser. Um, but all of these poets, Lisa, Ron, and of course the amazing Allison Joseph will be really, uh, it'll be such a joy to listen to all of them. And it's so great to be with the Broad stage here again. Uh, so Rob, thank you so much for having us. Oh, it's my, my pleasure. And I'm, I'm in agreement. I am really looking forward to, to tonight for many reasons. Of course, uh, Allison Joseph is, is remarkable and I'm so excited to get, get her in here and get things started. Um, as you know, Bryn for me is also a little nostalgic because the very first event that I attended at the Broad Stage um, after after saying yes to come and join the join the team, um, Bryn was reading. So it's it's really a wonderful wonderful thing to to see her again. I wanted to ask you guys real quick. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn about here for a second. I wanted to ask you each a quick question, which is what if anything is normalizing for you? We're in, we're in week four of our little thing, which is great, and I'm I'm thrilled about the about these poets and what they're bringing and how much I, I think inspiration and and relief and joy and interest they're bringing to the moments that we're having at home right now. But I want to ask each of you, what if anything is normalizing? Uh, so I'll jump in and say that I finally realized that there was something I would do every few years, not every year, but every few years that I couldn't do this year because of the COVID thing. And so I decided to go and do this anyway. This is going to sound crazy to say on air, but I, uh, <laughs> I, I drove to Lompoc yesterday and adopted seven chicks. Oh, my God. Yeah. And so I have seven baby chicks that are three days old at my house that I'm taking care of. And when I was there, I met all these people who are adopting pets during the COVID crisis, puppies right. and kittens and chickens and like that. So there's quite a pet adoption thing going on. And I think there's something about adopting an animal. First of all, it means you're not alone. But I think also it just feels so humanizing, like I'm taking care of something here. I'm not by myself now and I'm taking care of somebody. So I adopted the seven chicks, mm. haven't named them yet, but um, I am taking care of them now at my house. So it makes me feel very human and very happy to have my seven chicks at the Red Hen Press house. It's perfect. <laughs> You've set the bar very high, Kate, because my nor normalizing thing isn't normal at all. I've gotten into gardening 
and I'm such a bad gardener, you know, when they have like morning dew farms and you can taste the love, like my arugula turns on me and like bolts and just squirts acid. And, but I have gained so much weight in this time because you mm. can't exercise. All you can do is go to the grocery store. So it's such a high point. So suddenly I'm like eating lemon cake and pork and salami. So I go, I gotta grow some lettuce. So I'm, I got some lettuce from the nursery and I'm growing it, which just means I took it out of its pots and put it in dirt. But there's something fantastic about that. So you're trying to keep animals alive. I'm trying not to kill my lettuce in a week, but they're already going down. But good question, Rob. And you? That's what I needed. I just needed to hear what's normalizing for people. <laughs> I, needed to hear. I don't know what's normalizing for me. Every day, it's a 52 card pickup. I mean, I, I would say nothing is normalizing, except for one thing. I will say one thing, which is that it turned, I'm so encouraged by all the late night hosts and all the news and yeah. all these people to see, first of all, that they're just as bad at this as we are. Yeah. <laughs> it is impossible to talk meaningfully to a green glowing light as if you're connecting with another person. So I just, I love the fact that, that I've, I've, I've learned to forgive myself for, for the complete lack of authenticity that comes with the format. But none, you know, other than that, nothing is normalizing. So I'm kind of taking it day by day. You know, I mean, think, and I say, I agree with you, Kate. Thank God I have my dog because boy, is he keeping me sane. Yeah. So there we go. But I'm glad to hear that from each of you. And, and let's, let's get Allison in here. Yes, here comes Allison. I just want to give a shout out to Bianca Richards, who is saying exciting poetry tonight. And she is all set with her lemon water. And so we're gonna go from there. So if I could in introduce our exciting poet tonight, Alison Joseph. Um, um, like, so Alison Joseph's latest full length book of poetry, Confessions of a Barefaced Woman, was published by Red Hen Press in 2018 and chosen as the gold slash first place winner in the poetry category of the 2019 Feathered Quill Book Award. Awards, a 2019 nominee in the poetry category of the NAACP Image Awards and a 2019 finalist for both the Montaigne Medal and the Da Vinci Eye Book Award, sponsored by the Eric Hoffer Book Awards. Her books and chapbooks include What Keeps Us Here, Soul Train, In Every Seam, Trace Particles, Little Epiphanies, Mercurial, Mortal Rewards, Multitudes, The Purpose of Hands, and the titles alone, these are the great titles, Double Identity, Corporal Muse, and What Once You Loved. And Allison lives in Carbondale, Illinois, where she directs the MFA program in creative writing at Southern Illinois University, where it is. She comes to us from her home now, where it is 10.08 at night. So thank you. Welcome, Allison. Woo! Woo! And Allison, can you please stand up and show us what you are wearing? Oh my gosh. Oh, so fan. This is how it's done, people. This isn't some Zoom hat, sweatpants stuff. Okay, tell us about what you're wearing. Well, I am a big fan of, uh, this is actually my school's color, maroon. So I'm a big fan of maroon. It's also a, uh, what they, I think the silhouette is skater dress. So it sort of yes. spins out. So. And I have a tradition that uh, dates back to dates back to when I was married. What I would bug my husband to take a picture of whatever dress I was wearing that particular day. So um, he passed away in October, but I'm st still trying to keep the tradition going. So people are like, "What dress is Allison going to wear today?" So got, got to keep the dress game going. And in and, and honor of that, and Kate and I, uh, you know, I don't know, Kate is always so beautifully dressed. I'm always in my sweatpants. I've worn a dress for you today. Woohoo! Yes! Yeah. Yeah. It's very right. unusual. And Kate, show us your dress. Yeah, I've got a dress. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> nice. And Rob, don't Listen. you have something to show us? Well, yeah. I'm wearing the scarf tonight, but I will tell you these are the shoes I would have been wearing. I would have been wearing these. Uh, very nice. Instead, I am wearing fuzzy slippers. Mm, well, yeah. Which is fantastic. We can see the shoes and you don't actually have to be wearing them. Uh, just saying Charles yeah. Harper Webb is here, Patricia Thompson, Elizabeth Agnes, Catherine Shore, uh, Karen, Karen, Catherine Shore and Patricia Thompson. Um, so everybody's here. So tell us, 
tell us, you're going to read us some poetry, thank God, and tell us, can you intro what you're going to read and why and how you're feeling? Well, um, I mentioned that I was widowed in October of this past year, so the subject of being alone and isolation has been, was on my mind before the whole coronavirus situation happened. And I was just starting to feel a little more human when it happened. I was starting to you know, reconnect with people. Um, and bam, what happened? We're all sort of, well, we should be. <laughs> Some of us have decided not to be, but we should be sheltering in place. We should be with our immediate others, and my immediate other is is now gone. So um, I chose these two poems with that in mind, but uh, the debate about what being alone means was something that was on my mind even before I lost my husband. So these two poems um, touch on that. And particularly being alone as a woman, which comes with its own sense of danger that you can be harmed. So this is called um, Instructions on Being Alone After Dark. In the dark, you are no raven, no crow with heavy plumage, no power of flight when lights turn on their halos, buzz of street lamps, a tepid music, Sidewalks that in daytime shone innocent and smooth now rise up to grab your ankles, trip your confident stride. So you must step wisely, carefully, saving the strut for the sunshine, making yourself small in the shadows, light of your flashlight guiding you past houses that in evening obscurity look like eager monsters, doors unwelcoming, windows afire with warmth you can't claim. Hope that passing cars hold no assassins, that, strep that passing strangers pass you without desire of injury, that roadside ditches stay uncomplicated, limbless. Hope that barking dogs stay chained, ghosts content in ancient dusty attics. It's never too late to reconsider. Guns, mace, self-defense classes, the need to be a woman alone, walking somewhere the world says she shouldn't. Destinations worth my time and days, my life. <laughs> that's so that's so powerful and, and and just so brave to write out of that play it's so all-consuming that feeling but you it, what powerful imagery and is it is it hard to to write that is there a time of day you write at night like because it's it's so powerful yeah um I'm not necessarily a, a frightened person. I don't necessarily live my life frightened all the time, but I am a lot more alone. This poem has kind of come true more now that I am widowed and that I am walking at dark, in the dark sometimes by myself just to get back to my home from, from campus or from, from the store. And there's always this feeling at the back of your mind um, is that car that just passed by does it does it does someone want to harm me um uh on the one hand you cannot necessarily live your life scared but on the other hand maybe you should be carrying mace or meant one of those devices that makes a very loud noise if anyone approaches you um Life is a gamble, but just depends on how. And I wanted that sense of sort of unease throughout the poem. 
But I also wanted it to be pretty. I wanted it to be a pretty poem. <laughs> and that's, that's the danger of art, you know, romanticizing something that is truly dangerous or painful. But it actually kind of holds a place where we can go there also, because mm -hmm. it is yeah, a bit, oh, okay, yes. So um, so do you want to read the, the second, do you want to set up the second poem? Yeah, the second poem also is in its way about being alone. Um, when you have, so many of us are, if we're working from home and we're not used to it, we're working remotely, um, if you've already, if you're already a person who's gone through the whole, how do I set up my work life divide? And maybe mm -hmm. these things aren't as present, but for me, not being on campus and not seeing students and not seeing other fellow faculty and staff members m puts me in my own head a whole lot more than usual. And I start thinking about, well, things that I've done that I regret. And <laughs> so this is a list poem all about <laughs> regrets. <laughs> regrets. And this poem comes from, it's the last poem in Confessions of a Barefaced Woman. So I have to thank Kate Gale again for publishing this book. Regrets. I should be watching my weight, counting calories, doing leg lifts and squat thrusts. Instead, I'm under six layers of thermal blankets watching Saturday morning cartoons featuring robots that look like animals or animals that look like robots. I should be writing letters on custom made stationery, engaging notes to long lost friends, high school buddies, college pals, Instead of reading gossip on the internet about celebrities I'll never meet and don't really like. I should be doing something productive in life, writing better poems, cooking exotic cuisines, but instead I'm eating noodles from a styrofoam cup, doodling in the margins of blank notebooks, writing tablets. I should be growing herbs and The video, my video froze in the middle of this fantastic poem. So um, I heard the part about herbs and I was so taken with that. So um, I'm gonna assume for the moment the video froze and that we will hear, we'll be able to come back to Allison to hear more of that <laughs> list, <laughs> which was very much my list. So I shan't be able to get to sleep until I, I hear the end of that. And yes, yes, so the video froze. I'm hearing from all of you, thank you. Um, yes, Amy Liu, Toby Harper, Lisa Cohn, Donald Petrie, Betsy Mars, um, Elizabeth Agnes, yes. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a moment. We will get, and that's a cliffhanger if I've ever seen one. So Alison Joseph is going to come back, if not super shortly, around 8.40 when we're gonna bring her back for a wrap up. And I think with luck, we'll hear the end of that poem. I don't think I'll be able to sleep tonight till I hear the end of, of her regrets. And I don't know about you, but we will do that. So in the meantime, we're going to pivot. Um, and just saying that if you've just joined us, this is the Red Hand Press Poetry Hour brought to you by The Broad at Home. I'm your host, Sandra Tsinglo. Keep the comments going. We, we can see you and thanks for your help. Um, and we're going to now go to the sort of the second half of the program, which is a combination of some live poets and some on video before we go back to Alison Joseph and we're gonna hear from Ron Kirchie at the end. Um, so now I, let us turn to, and this is exciting. So if I may say before we run the video, Maddie Lynn Glasgow, um, his book of poetry, Deciduous Queen, was selected by Richard Blanco for the Benjamin Saltman Award, which included publication. And Richard Blanco was our poet last week, our featured poet last week. So there's really a nice red hen family connection here. And so we're going to see a video by Maddie Lane Glasgow. Hey 
Hey y'all, it's Maddie. Greetings from Salt Lake City. I hope y'all are all hanging in there in this new strange world we're inhabiting. I'm gonna be reading a few poems for you today, so let's get to it. This first one is from my book, Deciduous Queen. It also originally appeared in Puerto del Sol, um, and it's about a make-believe strain of marijuana called Opuntia Macrocentro Kush. Um, and it's for all of my loves that are getting through this time smoking and edibling, um, and originally is for my bestie, Abby. Cactus Mouth, or Opuntia Macrocentra Kush. Wake, wake, and bake these West Texas cheeks, these garden city gums, they're so thirsty to hollow. Arid me, terrain me until I bear only you, take you in these La Misa lips, where you bury your spines in my sand flesh cheeks, a sore memory. So purple prickly pear cush, you wet succulent, you thorny yellow blossom, this mouthful didn't come from some small pot on a windowsill. It's a wild one, just off an anxious gravel road where I'm on my knees, looking as far as my glazed eyes can see into a fearless flatline horizon, some other joyous kind of desert. And I'll read one more from my book. This is about longing and desire, which I'm sure many of us who are spending this time alone um, can commiserate with. And it's also about glory holes. Um, it's called All Afternoon. Yesterday, I built a glory hole, but no one came. So I knelt alone without a claim. My eyes on the clean tile floor, the wall unstained, What's a boy to do with such shame? Kneeling hollow jawed in a duct tape frame. I crooned a hole is a hole all afternoon. A sinful hymn to fan some flamer's flame. There was no pilgrimage, no semen monsoon strewn hard pressed against that holy wall. Just an empty ark, an unanswered call. Blame anonymity, but we'll make this stall a relic today. I've got to untame your body. So come on, lean in, lay claim. When you can't see the face, it's all the same. And so from that, we'll wrap up with a newer poem I've been working on a sequence about canopy disengagement, which is this phenomenon where the crowns of trees in a forest do not touch, um, which has a very interesting resonance now since there is a lot less touching going on in the world. It's called canopy disengagement or the space between our limbs. Light enters through a separation. There are many names for this distance, canopy shyness, intercrown spacing, canopy disengagement, crown shyness, as though timidity or detachment are the only reasons why a thing might not want to be touched. There, there, island of a tree, just wait for the wind to blow you adrift into another for branch abrasion in the quick, violent tussle of limbs, the weather brings to remind you why you need your space. Dendrologists can't be certain if it's the light or the collision that keeps them apart, if it's the smell of one's neighbor or the fear of spreading hungry larvae that fosters this emptiness between them. When a man asks to touch me, I explain, we are not that kind of forest. Sometimes a man does not ask, 
and he has many hands. He is many men who all reach for the curb where branch meets trunk, as though this were their tree to climb, their space to fill. Must I be bashful to say no? Sometimes I love a man and he asks what I'm afraid of, hungry larvae. He wants to know what to do with the space between our limbs, let the light in. Then he tells me I can feel nothing. I understand his pining, but is the truth always the reason? The broken branch cannot be mended, nor the trunk unstripped of its bark after a heavy gale. Some abrasions never fade. Does a tree need a reason? Thanks, y'all, and stay safe and stay home. So even if we aren't together right now, we can get through this together. Love y'all. Incredible poetry, and I, I never uh, Glory Hall. Now, now I know how I relate to that. That was such a beautiful poem, "Into the Tree Canopies." Um, and it's it's it, such great poems for these times when we're all both connected and and apart. Um, so exciting news! Allison Joseph is back, but we're going to leave her incredible list poem. Harlan Rotblack said that's an amazing list poem. Till when she comes back at eight forty to finish that and forge forth with the rest of our poets in the second half. So stay tuned for that. Um, I'd next like to bring on a live poet who we're very excited to have tonight, um, Bryn Saita. Hi, hello. Um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you to Red Hen, thank you to The Broad. Thank you to Sandra for your amazing um, hosting tonight. And Rob, it's great to see you again. I remember that night we met uh, the preview night that was a very special magical night at the Broad and um, hope to be there again soon in person. Um, I think I'll read three poems this evening. I'll start with um, a poem I wrote about a year ago. It's a short little prose poem. Um, it's called Time Being and sort of takes its um, title from a, a novel I love by Ruth Ozeki called Tale for the Time Being. It's one of my favorite uh, recent novels, so a recommendation um, there. And it just, it's just a short little poem that kind of came out of nowhere, so I'll read that to you. Time Being. In the seminar on, on intergenerational ghosts, the girl in the back row folds paper to pass time, passes it forward, puts her small hand up in the dark and waits. When she's called on, the room's walls collapse outward and dust explodes. The students and the teacher wait under the night sky. Owls bloom and kittens crawl over the walls to reach them. The girl from the back row makes her way into the night air and across the rubble and the others follow. The great bridges look ghostly in the distance and the city sleeps. On a grass patch, the students form a circle. Around them, another circle forms. Faceless, soundless bodies of light loom proudly behind them. And beyond the light, another ring of ghosts. The girl says, do you recognize me? The girl says, I was always listening. I am already in the future, telling the story of how we lived. So that's that poem. Um, this next poem, I, I just wrote this poem maybe about four years ago. Yeah, 2016, 2016 I did. Um, it's called Things I Never Knew I Loved, and it sort of takes its inspiration from the poet Nazim Hikmet, the, the Turkish poet who has a poem called Things I Didn't Know I Loved. Um, and it's sort of just a list of, and I've been thinking about this poem because I guess I've been thinking about all the things I never knew I, I loved or I took for granted, you know, maybe until this moment. 
And um, it's also a poem I got asked to write when I read for the American Bookbinders Association. And I was asked to write a poem about bookbinding. And I thought, well, that's kind of not very sexy, but I'll give it a try. And um, this, is what, uh, this is what came out. Things I Never Knew I Loved after Nazim Hikmet's, also with a line by Stacey Ann Chin. It's April 16th, 2016. I never knew I loved the book, its careful spine and springtime stitch, the tercet's weaving of memory and blood, this love. If the body is a book, then I'm open. If the body is a book, then pain is the narrator. I'm on my back in the night again and sweating and imagining angels. I never knew I loved angels. I never knew I loved my body. The angels pull red ribbons of pain from me. The angels circle, the angels whisper, remember your childhood, how you loved the soil and dancing, how you dug your toes into the earth of the summer garden, your father planting and your mother near. I never knew I loved the garden and sky, and this city, though it destroys me, and these streets, though they deceive me, and this windswept, unpaced beauty, though where is the place for poetry? In the night, I am everything I fear. In the morning, I am all I ever want to be, a girl flying, a sprawling orchard under dawn, pink skies. I never knew I loved blooming. I never knew I loved the orchards of my youth and the boy who died there by his own hand and the boys from my hometown who rushed to war the way they rushed off summer decks once, flinging their bodies into the greatest bodies of water, their limbs unpinned, our fates unwritten, their limbs unstitched and wild, like ribbons of light. And I'll, I'll close with a poem um, that I, it was called Match for a long time. And then when Red Hen published it in my very first book, The Palace of Contemplating Departure, it got retitled it was called Spring San Francisco. Um, and now it's, I think I want to call it Match again. <laughs> and this is, I guess, the thing that, you know, poets do. Who was it? Valerie or somebody said a poem is uh, never done. It's only abandoned. Um, so I feel like even this poem might be five, seven years old, but I'm still editing it as we go. Um, so this is Match, my final poem. Thank you again, everybody. Um, I hope to share uh, actual stage space with some of you one day. It's an honor to be in this space um, with all of you tonight. Thank you. Match. You live in a house of sound and you live with a ghost. The one who stole your heart also lives in your heart. So you cut it out with a carving knife and you send it flying. You say sometimes you wake and wait for the God of loneliness to leave you alone. I say our city is small and teeming with ghosts and there are no seasons for hiding. So we let go of the ones who called us by our names. We make ourselves new names by tracing letters in a sand tray with sharp stones. This is called patience or practicing solitude or the wind will ruin everything, but what does it matter? Let's go for beauty every time. You say the price we pay for love is loss. I say the price we pay for love is love. Sometimes you have nothing save your hand and the glove and the glove against wind and you're jabbing at the sky now in the match of your life, but the sky never fights back. So you praise it. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, and thank you for submitting us. This is Red Hen Poetry Hour brought to you by the Broader Film on the House Campus in Rowe. Just some shout outs. Um, we have some hellos from Donald Techie, Brynn, Willoughby Kaplan, Claude, that he and Donald Poe says hi, Liz Hunter, Sam Link, Jesse Mars, has Cooper Smith, too, Cozy Harper, says shout out to Brynn and also to Maddie before. Elizabeth says beautiful. Um, Maddie Lynn gives shout outs. Out, out and then Maddie and and Liz says uh, I love the Christian in poems directed with angels and everything. And I think there was something years ago about what 
Hi, everybody. Sandra, thank you. I couldn't hear you, unfortunately. There was something wrong with the audio, and I hope you all can hear me. Um, I wanted to say that I always view poetry and the arts as true solace for the spirit, and I'm so grateful to Red Hand and to the Broad Stage for creating this community when we all, I think, need it more than ever. Um, the three poems I'm going to read tonight are all in some ways, I believe, about refuge and sense of place and what anchors us in life wherever we are. Uh, my first poem is very much about refuge, um, how I think from birth, really, life asks us to find it on our own. Uh, this poem is called Body Song. The baby I watch doesn't want me. She calls for her mother again. Let her, my friend said. She is learning to be alone. Monitor din, then hush in languorous waves to learn absence. What soothes ragged desire? A woman by our gas station rocks herself to sleep like a baby. Her battery of blanket and tarp shifting, flapping against disconsolate gusts of traffic fume. She looks like my mother, who rocked me. Body song, blanket of gown, fragrance of restoration. I yearned to rock my daughter when illness swaddled her. A mother's allowance. I want to be alone, she said. Moon behind clouds, lambent dark falling fast. How sleep came. Once I saw the woman stop rocking, slump over, close her eyes. I forgot gas. Uh, right now I'm working on a series of poems um, I call still life poems related, I think, to the compositions of our lives that we create for ourselves. I'm a psychologist, and um, right now I'm working with people by Zoom or FaceTime or just phone. And this poem was inspired by one of the people I work with who's having a very hard time with the quarantine. It's called Still Life Origami. Can't breathe, she said. Chest hurts to inhale. Isolation flattens me, she said. My body folds into itself. Breathe like this, I said, slow and ocean deep. Sound of my mouth, air from my body on the phone. My head is light, she said. The stars, what if I pass out? I am all alone. Your breath will bear you, I said, as a raft. The phone on my desk went dark, a little black box. I caught my breath. Twilight, the whisper of a thousand cranes. I heard her breathe. I breathed, breathing. My last poem is about, I think of it as a, about a, about a form of collective isolation that all of us in Southern California are familiar with, uh, freeway congestion and the opportunity that is embedded sometimes in isolation. Heading out in Los Angeles. Cement swans, shadow lanes in an eloquence of overpass. Interval of dusk for strangers and commute. Our collective solitude, its own darkness, through jams and delays, 
our depths of sluggish protraction stops and starts with opportunities for dream, each of us growing anonymous, becoming an increment of time, particle of largesse. Illusions of separation dissipate like exhaust. Valley of red light, valley of white, weaving in and out of ourselves. Thank you and peace to all of you. Thank you, Lisa. I love that men, you hear me. I know that you were coming in the chat with the center of camp. Uh, Alice, Genevieve, Greg, Aline, and Donald Kitty, also fans of Lisa's work. Uh, I don't see anything coming up that you can't hear me. So, if they could join us, let him have four three hours with parts of the at home. And now we'll turn to, and I'm going to hold up this time that I made. So bad, so bad audio. So here we go. I'm prepared. Hi, this is Elizabeth Bradfield, and I'm going to read a poem from my first book, Interpretive Work, because it's spring, and for the second time in my life, I find myself living on a cul-de-sac cul-de-sac linguistics. Today, the boys call each other penis. Hey, penis, come here, penis. Pass me the ball, penis. Last week, it was whore, discovered halfway through a game of horse on the mini hoop that backs my fence. And earlier this afternoon, the teenage girls whose bedroom window stares above my thumbnail yard improvised outgoing messages in theatrical rapture. First, the easy scatological. Then, a nursery rhyme that morphs into an anti-homo riff so suddenly I actually look up to see if they're directing this at me, they must be, down in the yard, reading poetry as my girlfriend weeds the flower beds. Oh, the high profanity of kickball games, the rough posturing demanded by even this tame street. Listen, they're learning how well bastard fits with fucking how ass can't be misused. No one could hope to ease their jagged entries into this profane world, which is fucking beautiful. Ass bastard gorgeous, the evening light wild and soaring like kickballs on a true arc into flower beds of penis tulips and pussy daffodils that nod their heads in wild agreement with the whorish, shit-loving lot of it. We are back. Uh, that in the middle of that, uh, uh, can you hear me? I, I think that we wanted to hear more of the fantastic poetry, and it was so uh, mesmerizing. Um, so, better sound. Okay, we may go back to that video that seemed to cut off in the middle, but I think as my phone is chiming off. Um, okay, let's bring back Allison Joseph while we can to complete. The cliffhanger moment, a hanger moment of the poetry. <laughs> it's exciting. It's exciting. It's live. That's what's happening. We love it. And we were I all regret listening not to you. Having, I regret not having true house Wi Fi. That's that, 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 that what we'll add to the, add to we the poem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to start. In honor of you, Sandra, we're going to start with the plant section here. Um, so this is an excerpt now. <laughs> we're going to roll with this. This is an excerpt now from a poem titled Regrets, which is from my book, Confessions of a Barefaced Woman, which was published in 2018 by Red Hand Press. I should be growing herbs in a lush garden overflowing with fragrant sprigs of basil and thyme. Instead, I'm at the grocery store buying pre-washed lettuce in plastic bags, wilted green soggy under fluorescent lights. I should be smaller, feel longer, scars cleared up, moles gone, fingers elegant enough to make spanakopita, dim sum, minced meat pies, Samosas. I should learn 
cake decorating, swirling frosting in elaborate creamy peaks on a cake so magnificent no one ever cuts it. Instead, I'm scarfing down Little Debbie snack cakes behind a locked office door. I should be a woman who doesn't say I should be. No regrets about her growing waistline or shrinking lifespan. No regrets about choices made or unmade. No efforts at sophistication left. I should be tired of everything. Unfaithful to everything. Unwilling, unready, unlovely. I should be, but I'm too familiar with what I can't be. And I can't stop thinking I should be that woman who can tell one plant from another, who saves the early shoots of tomatoes and carrots instead of mowing them down, mistaking them for weeds. <laughs> and I came back to the herbs, which I kind of began the growing of the herbs and the lettuces and the cake frosting. That was so. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. And it's funny because we've all been talking about all oh, the new habits we're going to require. And uh, I I know from my own experience, because there's like a busted guitar over in the corner over there and a whole bunch <laughs> of harmonicas. Um, yeah, these these projects, unless you're truly, truly dedicated, these projects are going to end up on the regret list. <laughs> <laughs> At, yeah, least, and, and at least for me. I shouldn't speak for anyone else. But, but I think the time that we're in, it's kind of a weird space because, uh, you know, so many of us are, are just really depressed and for good reason. Like, they're very good reasons. So even the, you know, like, today I'm going to make some eggs and then you can't even crack the egg. So I think there's something that is about that poem, but it's kind of magnified in this time of, you know, my, why not? My solution has been to Google whatever it is I want to do to Google like the easiest entry level version of it. So I wanted <laughs> brownies the other day. So I Googled like three ingredient brownies <laughs> and then it's progressive up to, you know, four ingredient, five ingredients. And if you master the three ingredient brownie, maybe you can move on to four and then the five. And before you know it, you might be making actual brownies, but in a global <laughs> pandemic, the, two ingredient or three, ing that'll do fine. You just want to shove some chocolate in your face. I think that bar is very high. I, I just go into the fridge and just kind of the spoon into the sour cream for no reason. <laughs> so that's the one ingredient, but you know. <laughs> when, I, when, I learned, when I learned that the basis of any of these recipes was Nutella, I was like, oh, I can do that. <laughs> I, I, if it involves Nutella, I can, you know, or, or any, any acceptable hazelnut chocolate spread. Let's not, you know, put one you know, brand out there and ignore all the others. You're making this look very good and with your dress, your skater skirt dress uh, as well. And, um, you know, so many people are enjoying you that we've gone in and out of the audio, but um, just totally giving you snaps. Uh, of the many uh, and, and yeah, that wasn't that wasn't deliberate, but now you know, maybe this is the precedent for future telecasts. Like, and <laughs> now the exciting conclusion of um, well, Harlan Rotblatt said that regret list poem is itself a perfectly frosted cake, and so I oh, think yes, thank you. It's it's right there in the poem. Um, well, any final? We're going to turn to one more poet in a moment, but. Just any any final thoughts about poetry in this time, your relation to it, and your listeners who are just such fans and are just very moved. And well, and um, while I was in Wi-Fi purgatory, <laughs> listening to to uh, Bryn and Lisa, and I'm so excited for Ron because I'm a big Ron Kirby fan. I I just taught him to my students when we were talking about poetry and humor and poets that uh, combine, you know, just a, a sardonic approach to the everyday. So I'm really excited for that. Uh, reading poetry is really good in these times because if you can't read a whole novel or even a whole short story, you can probably, you don't 
have to read, you can read any kind of poem. You can read Langston Hughes, you can read Kim out and Eat Show, you can you can read any number of poets. You can read Wendy Cope. There's a poet out there for you. So it will probably help repair some of the things that are going wrong in your brain, like the connections that aren't because you're so feeling so horrible right now. So just uh, read some poems, read poems um, from across the decades. Read Emily Dickinson, you know, read, read whoever floats your boat. Just go to the Poetry, Poetry Foundation website and dig in. Go to the Academy of American Poets website and dig in. There, there's bound to be poems that speak to you in this particular moment. And I know that there are a lot of poets out there that actually are generating poems for this particular moment, um, poems that speak to. So if you go to a site like uh, New Verse News, for example, that's a site that publishes topical poems about things that are happening right now. So if you're, if you're one of these people that says, oh, poetry has nothing to do with the current moment, actually there are, are uh, quite a few magazines, websites that are publishing poems that have to do with right now. And of course, people can also get your latest full length book of poetry, Confessions of a Barefaced Woman, published by Red Hen Press the in Barefaced. Tried to remember where my makeup actually was so I could put some on, but I couldn't. So. <laughs> once so again, masks now. <laughs> once, once again, I, I am a failure at uh, performative femininity. <laughs> But your poetry is always a fully frosted cake. So thank you. Thank you. Thank this you. has been so much fun. So much. It's it's been such a sheer pleasure. And thank you for shedding light in just such a crazy time with everything you're doing. So we really thank you so much. And and get the books. So um, and I do want to go back. You know, we, we had a slightly jumpy um, video time this evening. Uh, you know, but uh, as per Elizabeth Bradfield's poem the uh poems in the chair just maddie lynn glasgow who was a poet on earlier said penis tulips and a rocking chair love it liz so i think that we've really heard such a such a range of incredible poetry this evening um so much but it's just not done yet because and some of you are saying hi to each other linda weird and neil is saying hi to harlan elizabeth agnes etc et et hi 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 um so last but not least as we like to say a big favorite in our show is uh, Mr. Ron Kirchie. Hi, everybody. We're here in the middle of uh, Poetry Month, April. I have some birthday news. Kate and Mark of Red Hen have uh, birthdays in April. I do. I say modestly. And William Shakespeare's birthday is in April, April 21st. William has left the building, so... My friends and I, all of whom you've heard in the last 45 minutes, and I will carry on. Um, the first poem I'm going to read uh, is called Reading at the Christian Academy. Um, it's a self-explanatory title because you know the setting, you know who's there. But I have to <clears throat> preface it by saying not that there isn't plenty of money in poetry, but I also write fiction for young adults. And um, that's what I used to travel for. So I was contracted to read at a Christian academy. And some of my YA fiction is, to use an old fashioned word, racy. So that's all you need to know. Here's the poem. Reading at the Christian Academy. I arrived and was ushered into a smallish room. A man with a tie said, I'm afraid there's been a mistake. The librarian who got in touch with you is no longer with us. But we can pay you if you would consider to tutor for a few hours and try to control yourself. So I talked to a dozen students about the sentence fragment and the comma splice, and they talked to me about my bracelets and the visible tattoo. They asked me why I was like I was. And I said, I didn't know. They promised to pray for me. And I said, thanks. That night, 
In the motel, there were two Gideon Bibles. I lay in the narrow bed there, I called my wife, and I read a passage from the Song of Solomon. This is the passage. Your lips distill nectar, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. The scent of your garments is like the scent of Lebanon. Oh boy, she said, honey, come home. I smell good, and I'm barely wearing any garments at all. My second poem is called, and this could not be more appropriate in the season that we're in, I Like to Stay Home. I like to stay home. I like to walk out front. I like to look at the Mexican sage or to the west side of the house where my neighbor Jim has put in some new leaded glass decorated with roses. Around back are the savory garbage cans, savory anyway, to the resident possum who usually wakes me up about 2 a.m. A little beyond that is a clothesline, and if it is hung with laundry, it is very pleasant to sit on the steps with one of the cats and watch the breeze move a blouse hung upside down like an acrobat. My friends go to Bangkok and the Black Forest, but I settle for my house, my yard, a dozen amaryllis, garbage cans, and a possum to summon me back to this world. If he is very loud one night, I get up and I go outside in my white pajamas. Above is the butter-colored moon, underfoot crushed mint. And over there is the possum. So I tell him to shoo, go home. And I clap my hands delicately like a lady at court applauding a harpsichord. I follow his tail around the corner and Jim has left a light on and there are those roses, the ones that never get to drop their petals on a blue runner like they do at my house. And finally, a new poem called Elder Care. Um, I, don't, I don't usually write occasional poems, but I guess the virus is an occasion that we're all writing about. Uh, th this poem came from um, the habit in my community anyway, of a large, large markets, uh, giving over an hour in the early mornings to people 65 or over. Um, it's just a terrific thing to do. Um, gives people time to shop, uh, the place isn't so crowded. Uh, it's very generous. So I wanted to investigate this phenomenon and I disguised myself as an older man and made my way into the market where I found to my delight and surprise that the music they were playing is the music from the 50s, music that I danced to and made out to and was broken up with to. So this all came together and made this poem called Elder Care. This is, for the record, the last poem of mine today. This is uh, Kill One. Here's the poem. My favorite market now has a senior's first hour. The usual soft music designed to make shoppers browse at their leisure has been replaced by D.D. Sharp's mashed potato time and Little Eva's a locomotion. And if we don't follow Little Eva's advice to the letter and make a train now, we do move a little faster like robbers in our masks and gloves while a bearded man waits in the parking lot with the motor running. I'm considering some sad bananas when on comes the peppermint twist by Joey D and the Starlighters. Some of us start to smile. We sway above our sturdy shoes. We inch closer with our cards just a little in case somebody, even under the circumstances, wants to forget why we're here and dance. That's my part of the evening. Thanks, bye. Ron Kirchie, always oh, so human, so incredible, so funny.
so poetic. Um, and, uh, and, and it's so wonderful in this program that the poets do listen to each other and it's fun to see that Alison Joseph is giving a comment to Ron Kirchie of, of just snaps and praise and all of your comments have been so amazing. So um, this actually concludes this segment of the Red Hand Press Poetry Hour brought to you by the Broad at Home, it's the Broad Stage at Home. I'm your host, Sandra Singlo. I'd like to give a shout out of thanks to all of our poets, our featured poet, Allison Joseph, also Maddie Lynn Glasgow, Bryn Saito, Lisa C. Kruger, Elizabeth Bradfield, and of course, we just heard Ron Kirchy. And Greg Bell says, lovely landing on that last poem. Charles Harper Webb says, well done everyone. And I think we're gonna see Charles Harper Webb uh, here in a week or two. Uh, so please join, um, please go on to all the uh, social media for Red Hand Press and Broad Stage. Don't forget that tomorrow in the morning at 11 is uh, the Broad Music Mornings and tomorrow will be uh, David Broza is tomorrow. And the next week, we're always here at 8 p.m. on Saturday night. We are your destination on Saturday night. And I believe uh, next week is going to be, uh, it's here on my phone, um, Ellen Bass. Uh, so stay tuned for that because there's much more poetry next week. And we want to thank all our poets tonight. And thank you to our producers, Kate Gale um, and Rob Bayless. So that is it. Thanks to you all and have a wonderful evening. See you tomorrow if you're doing the Broad Stage music and see you next Saturday night. We'll be here. Thanks. <laughs>